Please take your Bibles once again this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 28. We'll begin where we have begun more than once recently with that part of the Bible that we know as the Great Commission, the Lord Jesus' Great Commission in which he gave this task to go out and seek the lost and preach the gospel to all the nations, to his disciples. I'll read Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Well, let's once again look to God and ask for his help as we come to his word this morning. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and that we know that it is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. But we also are conscious that we need the help of the Holy Spirit if we are to profit from your word today. So we ask that you would send your spirit, grant me your spirit to preach your word faithfully. Help us all to hear it, conscious that It contains, it is the very words of life. And we pray that those words would be life to some who have come here today apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would manifest your saving power through the gospel this very day here and throughout this world, wherever that word is proclaimed. And we ask these things in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Peter Jeffrey, in his small book, How Shall They Hear, wrote, It is no use mourning over the way the world thinks of Christ if we do nothing to make him real to men and women who are dead in their sins. As God's people, we, just as the apostles, back in the day when Jesus departed from them and ascended into heaven and left them with the task of world evangelization, just as they, we need to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to sinners. We need to tell them the good news that there is salvation in Christ. We need to evangelize them. You remember that the word evangelism means good news. So to evangelize means to tell the good news. And it is good news. It is the good news that was summarized in that passage that Pastor Smith read from Acts chapter 13, the news that there is forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. The setting or the backdrop of the good news, of course, is that there's bad news, The bad news is that everyone comes into this world as a sinner. And so he is in need of the grace of God. He's a sinner because of his sin in Adam. We we call that original sin. And that includes the fact that we come into the world with sin natures. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone is estranged from God. People in the world like to think that people are basically good. That is not the message of the Word of God. The message of the Word of God is that people come into the world basically 
bad. Bad. And because of that, we are estranged from God. Or you could say it the other way around. Because we are estranged from God, we are bad. But both are true. And we need to be saved. And it is only the gospel that can save sinners. Only the gospel can save you from your sins. You may not look at yourself as a bad person if you're not a Christian. You may think, I'm not that bad a person. You may think, I'm better than most. And you may be better than most of the people you know. You may know people who are enslaved to sins such as sexual immorality or alcoholism or pride or whatever. And you look at their lives and you say, well, it's evident that they are the slaves of sin. But if you're not a Christian, you are by definition a slave of sin. And you need to have the power of sin broken. And you need to have your sins forgiven. And there is no way to have the power of your sins broken or to have your sins forgiven but through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news, as we read it there in Acts 13, that there is forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. The good part of that gospel message is that God was pleased in the language of Scripture to bruise His own Son, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. That is, that God put Him to death on the cross so that you might be delivered from your sins. It says in the Scripture, and I'm going to preach on this text tonight from John chapter 3, that whoever believes in Him will not perish. He will not go to hell. He will not suffer eternal torment, but he will have everlasting life through Jesus Christ. That's the good news. And as Scripture says, through Him, if you believe in Him, if you put your trust in Him, repenting of your sins, you will have the forgiveness of sins. That's the power of the gospel to bring sinners to saving faith, to bring sinners to be reconciled to the God from whom they have been estranged. You need, if you're not a Christian here today, to believe that message because as the Bible says, there is no other name other than Jesus Christ given by which you might be saved. It must be through faith in Christ. This is the gospel we proclaim, the same gospel that the apostles proclaimed centuries ago. We don't need to change it because sinners are still estranged from God and they're in need of reconciliation to God. And we don't just preach this message for the sake of seeing sinners come to repentance and faith in Christ. We preach it for the people of God because it is our meat and drink. As Christians, we yet have remaining sin and we need to live at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why we sing in one of those hymns that those who know the story best like to hear it as much as the rest. Well, we've been studying, therefore, the subject of evangelism, preaching the good news, bringing the gospel to sinners in the world around us. We began several weeks ago with the biblical mandate for the church's task of evangelism. We saw from this passage and then also from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 and Philippians 2 that uh, these are three main passages on evangelism in the New Testament. We saw that we as the church must feel the pressure of this mandate to evangelize our world. Then in the second place, we saw biblical motives for the task of evangelism. I organized them under two main headings following the two great commandments, the, the things that should motivate us always to bring the gospel to the lost, our love to God, our desire to see His name glorified, and love to men, the desire to see them brought to all the blessings of salvation which we as God's people have come to know. The third thing then, last time, 
we began this was we began to consider legitimate means for the accomplishment of the task. And last time we considered ordinary means. That was a couple of weeks ago. But then the next thing, I'm following still the uh, pastoral theology lecture that we had when I was in the academy here many years ago. The next heading is extraordinary means, things outside of the normal things we do as the people of God, such as preach the gospel in the church. And as I considered this and spoke with my fellow elders, uh, we determined that a setting that would be more suitable for me to address that subject would be the adult Bible class. So God willing, next Lord's Day, I'm going to finish that point of legitimate means for the accomplishment of the task in the adult Bible class. So today then, we'll, I'll go on to the next thing. In my outline, it's Roman numeral four, practical considerations to guide us in seeking to fulfill our task of evangelism. So in some ways, uh, this is practical application of some of the things that we've seen, especially the fact that we need to preach the gospel to sinners. These are practical considerations to guide us in seeking to fulfill our task of evangelism. And I'm hoping to cover this in two messages. This morning, I want to cover, or at least almost cover, the first point, and it's this, that there are some errors, common errors, and pitfalls that we must avoid. And I have a total, I believe, of six things. Yes, yeah, six things, but I'm only, no, seven things, actually. Seven things, I only expect to get through six this morning. I'll bring the next one in the next message and some of these things are things that were part of that pastoral theology lecture. Some of them are not. If you're paying attention, you'll probably be able to figure out which ones were and which ones were not by the headings. <clears throat> because I did not strive for uniformity in the things I added in. At any rate, we must avoid some common errors and pitfalls in our efforts to evangelize. And the first one is this. It's the temptation to make evangelism the be-all and end-all of the Christian life or the church's work. That is, it is not, when I say it's not, we're not to make it the be-all and end-all of the Christian life or the church's work. It is not the chief or all-important element in the things we do as a church. Simply preaching the gospel to lost people is not the only thing that God has called us to do as the church. Listen to Jesus' words again, or read along with me in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Jesus said, "'Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations,' baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Evangelism is an important part of the church's task, bringing the gospel to the lost. But it is not all of the church's Task. You see how Jesus says there, you're to not only seek to make disciples of all the nations, that is, preach the gospel to them, bring them to repentance and faith through that preaching, but you're also then to teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. In other words, you're to carry on the life of the church of Christ. There are a lot of things to teach Christians, and that's the role of the church just as evangelism is. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to do that work. We sang, as Pastor Smith pointed out in our hymn, we long to see thy churches full. And part of the reason we long for that is not just that we want to have big churches, or that pastors want to make more money, 
or that we want to get a name for ourselves, that's not it. We want them to be full because this is the means by which God saves His people. It's not just the preaching of the gospel initially. It's the teaching God's people to observe all things. And there will be more about that, God willing, next Lord's Day. But many of us have been in settings where the be-all and end-all was preaching the gospel to sinners. Or we've had that kind of a mindset before. We perhaps have sat in churches or been members of churches where every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening, if there was an evening service, it was always an evangelistic message. Maybe purely an evangelistic message. Maybe it was a, a church, as some of you may have been in or known, in which there was always an altar call. And the focus was constantly and almost only evangelism of the lost. And churches like that and people who think in that way can easily become malformed. They are not taught to observe all things that Jesus has commanded. Of course, people who don't evangelize at all are also malformed Christians. But we've been talking about that for, for a good time and trying to impress upon us the need to evangelize. But here I'm talking about the fact that it can be overemphasized to the place that churches or God's people can become malformed. Think, for instance, of a man who likes to go and work out at the gym. But all that he works out is his right biceps. You go to the gym... You say, man, that guy really likes to work hard. Every day I come, I see him working out. He's here when I get here, and he's here when I leave. Come to think of it, though, all he does is he's curls, and he only does them with one arm. Now, what's going to happen with that man? He's going to become malformed. He's going to have a huge right biceps muscle. Maybe his right biceps would compete with Mr. Universes. I don't know, but... Maybe it would, but the rest of his body wouldn't. Not his spindly legs, not his pot belly, etc. You get the picture. It's, he's malformed. Well, there are many churches that as I think of the way they evangelize, when I just think of that area, I, I have nothing for them but commendation. I like to look at them and think about them and think, God, help me to have more evangelistic fervor. You hear an evangelistic message, even as God's people, I say, it stirs you up. To me, it stirs me more up to hear an evangelistic message pointed at sinners than it does to hear a message on evangelism. But again, I believe we need to hear all the things that Jesus commanded, so I take my time to preach on the subject of evangelism as well. But I commend such churches. It's, it can be healthy. I know of a church back in the Twin Cities that I'd um, spend some time in because our kids went to school there. And they had a whole huge rack of tracts up in the front lobby for the taking. And then they had a sign. You've probably seen this in a church above the front door. You are now, as you go out the doors, you are now entering the mission field. That's a good emphasis for a church to have. We need to have that kind of emphasis in our lives and in the ministry of the Word. But you see what I'm saying? A church that solely focuses on that and makes that the be-all and end-all can become malformed. Their, their right biceps, if you will, is their evangelistic activity. But it is at the expense of teaching the whole counsel of God. There may be evangelistic sermons, but there's not broader doctrinal teaching. Not teaching on vital aspects of Christian living. So that the depth of people's biblical knowledge and understanding is very shallow. And sometimes as long as they remain in such a church, it's going to remain very shallow. And believers are therefore relatively immature in such churches. There's an emphasis on evangelistic activity 
often to the point that other basic Christian duties are neglected. Private devotional exercises, things like family worship, other domestic duties, even attendance at the public means of grace, the church's services. Christian growth can be stunted if it even happens. And the consciences of God's people are sometimes wrongly bound as to what their primary Christian duty is. So the first error, the common error or pitfall we must avoid is the temptation to make evangelism the be-all and end-all of the Christian life or of the church's work. The second is this, the crippling, guilt-producing notion that every Christian has or should have the gift to be an evangelist. The crippling, guilt-producing notion that every Christian does have or should have the gift to be an evangelist. We have seen that the Bible does does lay the task of bringing the gospel to the lost squarely on the shoulders of God's people, squarely on the shoulders of the church. We've seen that. But although there may be some people and some churches you might think knew of a text of Scripture that requires every Christian to be out knocking on doors or handing out tracts, or holding evangelistic Bible studies, or preaching on a street corner, there is not such a text that tells us that every single Christian much must be engaged in that kind of direct evangelistic activity. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, chapter 12. As I said, we don't have a text that teaches that every Christian should have the gift to be an evangelist and to be always out there on the front lines trying to find unbelievers and to bring the gospel to them. Look at Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. Here's a passage of Scripture that recognizes the fact that people have different gifts, different gifts of the Spirit, different areas of strength, and therefore usefulness in the Christian church. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I've mentioned, I think even in the last message on evangelism, that to give the essence of the gospel in a brief, clear, winsome An effective manner is a gift. It is a gift that not all of God's people have. It's something that can be learned. It's something that can be cultivated. And to some degree, we should all be cultivating it. Because as I said, even if you're not a front lines evangelist, yet there are going to be places in which you are for the moment And even if it's with one other sinner on the front line. And you'll be there in a way that perhaps no other Christian could be there with that person. Because of the contacts God has given you. We should strive to cultivate that gift to some degree. But it cannot necessarily be well cultivated by just anyone. Think of the mentality that exists in some seminars that you could attend out there in the world. Maybe you could attend a seminar on speed reading. Sometimes you've heard those kinds of things advertised. Read so many thousands of words in an hour, or maybe pages in an hour probably. I attended one of those once. 
I can't, I can't read anywhere near the level. I did all my exercises, all my homework. I felt like I got something good out of the class. But I can't read through a 400-page a, a volume on theology in two or three hours and then sit down and uh, write out the things that I read like some people purportedly can do. But that's how they'll advertise some of these things. You come and take this seminar, you learn our method, and then they say this is what you'll be able to do. Or there are seminars on uh, running your own business, starting your own business. And they talk about it and they say, you know, all it really takes is desire. You listen to that thing? Oh, man, I, I desire to work for myself. I don't like working for the guy that I work for. I desire to make more money than I make right now. You go to the seminar, you get the book, you get the tapes and so on. Some people, I, I, I believe what they say. It did really work for them. But it wasn't just the desire. It wasn't just the desire. Not everybody has it in him to run his own business. Not everybody has the mind that he can organize things and keep track of things and manage people or go out and sell what he's trying to sell. Not everybody has what it takes. I'm not saying it can't be gained with hard work. I'm not saying a little bit gift can't be cultivated and to be made into a much better, stronger gift. I'm simply saying not everybody has it. And likewise, this is true with Christians and with evangelism, much as we may not like it. You may know other Christians who you spend some time with them, you meet someone you've never met before within five minutes. He's in a conversation, and he has given the essence of the gospel. He's done it in a winsome way to that person. And you think to yourself, why can't I do that? Shame on me, you think. Well, maybe to some degree. That if you don't have the zeal, you don't have the love for sinners to that, that person, that you may not have the gifts that God has given to that person. Strive to learn from him. Strive to be like him. Pray that God would grant it to you. But it's just like the, the whole Christian life, brethren, we have to... Think of it this way. Some people have gifts for preaching. Some people do not. Some people have such hearts and they're so, such giving people. They can be people who have the gift of hospitality, for instance. Now, we all should strive to exercise hospitality. But we're not going to be like some people who have a peculiar gift for it and grace is that God has given them. Some people have a gift of giving. He who gives, it says in Romans 12, 6, with liberality. You may want to give with liberality the, the way that some brethren in the church give. But then maybe it goes back to that seminar on business again. And you don't have that to give, and you may only be a giver like the widow with her might. And you'll have to put it in perspective, and you say, well, in some senses, perhaps I give more than the one with the gift for giving. But may God help us, brethren, to keep these things in a biblical perspective. Then there's another common error that we must avoid, and it's this, the numbing conscience-saving notion that all evangelistic concern and activity will simply take care of itself. The numbing, if we think this way, will become uh, people with numbed minds, if you will, numbed consciences. The numbing, conscience-saving notion that all evangelistic concern and activity will simply take care of itself. What is that? That's presumption. It's presumption. Sinful presumption. We need to remind, remind ourselves and go back to some of the texts we've seen. I began one or two of these sermons with Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. Those who were scattered from the church in Jerusalem in the early days through persecution, those who were scattered, it says, went everywhere 
preaching the word. They were bringing the gospel where God had taken them. We can take the realization that I, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, that not every Christian has a peculiar gift to be constantly engaging in evangelistic activity. He doesn't have the time, perhaps, either. But we can take that realization that not everyone is equally called to this task. And we can reason, I'm not gifted, so I don't have any role in evangelism. Or we can say, well, well, because God hasn't gifted me with that peculiar gift, like Pastor Chansky talked about, the brother who can be in a conversation about the gospel with someone within a few minutes of meeting him. Therefore, since that's not my gift, I don't need to worry about being ready to give an answer. No, you do. You do. You ought to be concerned about that. Even if you don't give it with the eloquence. Even if it takes you... Ten minutes to say what that brother can say in two minutes. And you don't feel like you've said it well. You should strive to do that. Or we can say, for instance, that since God is sovereign and God will certainly save all of the elect, we don't need to be anxious about evangelizing sinners because we know that God will save every one of his own, whether I'm taking part in that effort or not. Do you see what I'm saying? A numbing, conscience saving notion that all evangelistic activity will take care of itself. Or we can take the principle that we've seen in an earlier message that our godly lives are crucial to the effectiveness of our witness. And we can give in to the temptation to believe that if we simply then live godly lives, but don't open our mouths, people will be saved through our silent witness, if you will. Now, there are some situations in which the Bible tells you, especially, for instance, in 1 Peter 3, for a woman, a Christian woman married to an unbeliever, who is hostile to the gospel and does not want to hear it, in that situation, the Bible says, strive to win him without the word, without opening your, your mouth, and at least in his mind, nagging him about the gospel. But see, the Bible doesn't tell us that we should, since we know that godly lives are very important, just try to win people by your life and not opening your mouth. Or we could take the principle that God is especially, this was the last message I believe, God is especially pleased to use preaching to save sinners. And we can rationalize this way. We can say, well, it's not my job. It's the pastor's task. But listen to the words of Peter Jeffrey from the, the book I quoted at the outset. He says, most people who are converted first hear the gospel through one of two channels, the Christian home or the personal witness of a friend. You should think in those terms. There are undoubtedly, you should conclude, people I know that are only going to hear the gospel through me if they hear it. No, we have seen that the church has been commanded to evangelize and you and I are part of the church of Christ. May we all strive to see, brethren, that we are like the Philippian church concerning, concerning whom Paul could say, I thank my God for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And there's a fourth error that we must avoid. We must avoid this common error or pitfall. It's this. Similar to the one I just mentioned, it's the numbing, conscience-saving notion that all evangelistic activity must be carried out entirely through organized church efforts. You might think, well, it's the task of the church. And the pastors need to tell us what to do as a church. Then, when they tell us, we'll do it. 
And that'll be our evangelism. Well, we want to encourage the church to some different uh, and new evangelistic efforts or maybe add some fuel to the fire of existing evangelistic efforts. And we're about that. That's part of what's going to be addressed in next uh, Lord's Day's adult Bible class. But listen once again to Peter Jeffrey on this subject. He says this. He says, The great danger of organized evangelism, whether it be a large campaign or door-to-door -door visitation by the local church, is that when the special effort is over, we think that is the end of it until next time. But the biblical concept is that witness is something for every day and for every Christian. This is by far the most effective kind of evangelism. See what he's saying? He's saying the mandate is relevant for all of our days. The mandate is relevant for all of our days. The motives, love for God and love for our fellow man, those motives are to goad us in evangelism all of our days. When you're in your backyard, when you're at the family gathering, when you're in the workplace, as well as in whatever corporate efforts as a church we may engage in. Not just our church efforts. And in subsequent message, I'm going to give some instruction, God willing, on personal evangelism and how to witness to your neighbor and so on. So there's the fourth thing. The fifth thing is this. The fifth error or pitfall that we must avoid. It's the artificial regimentation and imitation which does no justice to the vast diversity of gifts and opportunities present in any given congregation. Yes, I will. You didn't scare me this time. Leslie, when you said that. We must avoid the artificial regimentation and imitation which does no justice to the vast diversity of gifts and opportunities present in any given congregation. <clears throat> that heading was first composed when you were not here, Leslie. So it's not as though you were being ignored. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 6. And this point came up at least for a moment in the, the last sermon I preached as well. That's good for us to be reminded of this. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. And there's some similarity to one of the points we already saw about the different gifts that people have. Beginning at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is, a, it is the same God who works all in all. And then verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Now there's the point about different gifts that people have. But here what we're saying is this, is that in light of the fact that people have different gifts, we can't expect that we can just say, here is how you do evangelism. And it'll work for every person and in every situation. I remember when I was in Bible college, and some guys started telling about a, a certain way of doing evangelism. A book was written about it. And someone were, they were learning it at their church. And I thought, okay, this must be it. This is the way to do evangelism. As time went on and I learned more about the Bible and the Christian faith and evangelism and so on, I thought, you know, it doesn't work to just tell someone this is the only way you can do it. One of the things that helped me 
uh, in that regard. And, and no doubt I'll say more about this later on as well. But just to look at the life of Jesus and see how Jesus did not have a one-way approach. He didn't say the same thing to everyone. He was aiming for the same thing with everyone. But there were vastly different ways that he went about what he did. And we will encounter different situations in their particulars from what Jesus encountered there in the New Testament as well. So the evangelism seminar team comes to town. As these, these young men mentioned to me, they're going to teach the church a proven method for evangelism. But that, that approach is not necessarily tailored, as I said, either to the witnessers, the people who are going to do the witnessing in this case, or the witnesses, the people that they know and that are in their community. Maybe their church doesn't have the gifts the way the church does where this was initially used and had such great success. Or maybe their area is different. Maybe the people in this area are more educated. Or maybe they're less educated. Or maybe they come from different religious backgrounds. And the, the approach needs to be tailored to them. Maybe, maybe the approach relies a lot on one-to-one -one personal uh, witnessing and evangelism. Maybe there's a brother who doesn't have the ability to to preach or to, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, speak his way out of a wet paper bag. But maybe he has other peculiar gifts that can be useful. Or when seeking to engage in cooperative church efforts, we need to ask questions like what opportunities are available to us as a church? What is the manpower that is available to us as a church? This church might be able to engage in some kind of an evangelistic activity that the church I come from could not engage in. Because if you have two dozen people that were involved in it, even if every single member of the church were involved, you couldn't have that many people. We have to ask, what are our gifts? What is the number of people that we have that are interested, able, willing to engage in that kind of activity? What's their availability? What is their interest in a specific endeavor that we want to carry out? Turn with me to Acts 9. Acts 9, verses 36 to 39. This is the account of Tabitha or Dorcas. <clears throat> Peter was, sp had spent some, was spending some time in the town of Joppa, and it says, At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lyd Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Now, I'm not even reading the most exciting part of the story. You know that she, Dorcas, was raised from the dead. But when I read about this woman, Dorcas, or Tabitha, when I see the way that the widows were weeping and displaying her handiwork, these garments that she had made, I think to myself, this woman may have been a wonderful witness for Christ. Perhaps she made some of these garments to help people who needed them who were unbelievers. Perhaps she did. I don't know that. Even if they were all made for the saints, for God's people, Jesus said, by this, 
all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This woman was a very loving woman. And for all I know, she was a wonderful witness for Christ for that reason, even if she did not have that kind of gift for evangelism that I've talked about. I finally came to my first Helping Hands dinner Friday night. And I was sitting there and I was thinking about this whole subject of evangelism. This is one of the reasons we have that dinner on Friday nights. I thought to myself, I may know more theology than a lot of people. I may know the Bible better. I may know ways to speak, to convict people of their sins, whether from the pulpit or talking to them one-on-one. I may know what the gospel is and how to give it in a short compass. But I thought, you know, there may be some of these young teenage girls who are here who in the way they help a disabled person with a slice of pizza or in playing a game, or in just getting from point A to point B, there may be some young teenage girl who is proving to be a more effective witness for Christ than I am. This is the point I'm making, brethren. We have different gifts. We have different opportunities. We have to look at the opportunities we have and do what we can. And we ought not to despise any opportunities. And we ought not to despise any gifts. And we ought to recognize the value of all and seek to make use of them all. And we need to remember where we are preaching the gospel and continue to learn more and more about our Jerusalem and our Samaria And how we can bring the gospel to our Jerusalem and our Samaria. I think of some of the letters we we hear. Every letter we get from the Philippines, whether it's um, up in the Manila area, whether it's down there in Cebu, wherever it is. What's one of the great things they use for evangelism? Bible studies. Bible studies in homes, Bible studies in the workplace, Bible studies in the school. I get the impression, I can't believe it's far off. You put up a sign for a Bible study and a dozen or two dozen people are going to show up. I've talked with someone who talked about efforts here in the past at home Bible studies. I know they've been held. We've done it in Minneapolis. I remember taking hundreds of leaflets around advertising the home Bible study or the Bible study that we're going to have in the church building. And having zero or one person show up over a period of four to six weeks. I'm not saying give up. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, though, we have to try to find out things by which we can beat the bushes and actually have something come out of them. We need to strive to learn about our Samaria. I remember hearing a report about someone that years ago when I was in the academy, someone here was sending... Uh, Trinity pulpit tapes. They were just used old tapes to Ghana, a Western African country. And the person said, the reason I do this, I take an old beat-up tape recorder, I put the tapes in when I get on the bus, and I, I play the tapes. And when I start playing the tape, everybody is silent, and for the whole bus trip, people are hearing the gospel. Try that on your next train ride into the city on Monday. We, we have to know what works where we are and try different things. But see, a danger here could be, well, we know that's not going to work here. The, the home Bible studies, it's not nearly as effective here. We, we, and what do we do? We cross out everything. No, we don't say, well, we don't have those gifts. That won't work here. Well, that's not suited to the 21st century. No, we can't have that mentality. Evangelism is our duty. In in Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, I won't get the exact quote maybe, but he basically says, love love, uh, will have ingenuity. It will find a way to bring the gospel 
to sinners. We have to remember God who has uh, ordained that the gospel is what's to be preached for the salvation of sinners. He is the one who has made the sinners. And he still holds their lives in his hand and he knows He knows that it's that gospel that is still the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And then another, this will be the last one for this morning, another common error we must avoid. It's the unscriptural idea that since an outpouring of the Holy Spirit would automatically intensify evangelistic activity, We need do nothing until God sends one. That is, sends an outpouring of the Spirit. In other words, we can think that, well, if if God sends an outpouring of the Spirit, that's when people are going to get saved big time. So why bother knocking ourselves out in the meantime? Why not just wait until then? Let's look at Acts 2. Verses 1 through 4, and then verses 38 to 41. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Excuse me. So all of the apostles were speaking. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the focus goes on Peter. And as we get toward the end of the chapter, let's look at verses 38 to 41. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. See, this was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. And we can be tempted to think, well, well, that not until God pours out his Spirit in an unusual way like that. There have been great outpourings since that time. Just think of the Reformation. You think of the the first and second great awakenings. You think of some things God has done in places like India. In many places in the world. We're not in the midst of a time like that. We can be tempted to think, well, till that day comes, we just wait. Why bother knocking ourselves out? Why try going to, to fish in a place where it seems like there are hardly any fish? Why not wait until the salmon are starting to run and all we'll have to do is just whip our our line in there and we're going to bring something out. Brethren, we need to remember our duty is never affected by the sovereign providences of God. We are not called to make disciples of all the nations only when it's relatively easy. We're not called to do that. We must remember a scriptural principle to spur us on to sow when the ground is not yielding. And that principle is this. Jesus said it in Matthew 13, verse 9. Whoever has to him, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. I was talking with a pastor in the Midwest some years ago about this whole matter of evangelism. We are we're comparing notes about the kinds of things that his church has attempted and the kind of things our church had attempted. And we were comparing notes and saying, well, this was not all that fruitful. 
this was the, probably everything we discussed was not really all that fruitful. But as we are talking then about uh, wanting to avoid what's another pitfall, maybe I'll add on, no, I won't add on, but another pitfall could be thinking that all it's going to take is to just find the right thing, the right method, etc., and then people are going to be, no, that's not it. That's not it. But the point this other brother made to me was very helpful to me. He said, I believe that God is going to bless those who are making the effort. Even if he doesn't bless their specific endeavors. In other words, maybe God's purpose will be as we say, now we think we have the thing that's going to work in North Jersey. And we go at it with all our might. And maybe it will be relatively fruit, fruitless, but maybe God will start bringing people through other avenues that we didn't anticipate or we were not specifically focusing on so that at the same time God will be honoring and blessing those who have, who are doing what they can. More will be given, but maybe He will also be emphasizing that it is not the, the work or the gifts or the skill or the effort of the laborers, but it is God who gives the increase. And we need to remember that there's a subtle danger when you think about this matter of waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. There's a subtle danger that we can use our prayers for revival as a means to escape from our present duty. We know God is sovereign. We are longing for a great outpouring of the Spirit. We know how vital prayer is. I've underscored that already. That's going to be a point uh, coming up, God willing, next Lord's Day in the message. But what's our temptation? To then pray much, but do virtually nothing in terms of our evangelistic efforts. We can't do that, brethren. May God help us not to do it. Let me just close by reminding you of two of Jesus' statements regarding our evangelistic labors. I hope you always will keep in your mind. They both come from the Gospel according to John. Realize, brethren, that the fields are white for harvest. They were in the day when Jesus saw those men coming across the fields, the Samaritans, to talk to that man that had spoken to the woman about the, the water that gives eternal life. Remember that the fields are white for harvest. They were then and they have been ever since. We need to look at people out in this world as people who need the gospel of Christ People who need Jesus Christ. And the other thing to remember is that we must work while it is day. John 9 and verse 4. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Now I think Jesus was especially talking there about the days that he had before his life was given on the cross. I think that's what he was especially talking about. He wasn't necessarily talking about this day and age and about us. Yet the principle, the principle is relevant for us. We must work, brethren. We must work while it is day. We need to think of men who did take that principle and they lived it out in exemplary ways so that they stand out as great lights in all the church of Jesus Christ. You think of John the Baptist. He was a burning and shining light. Another one was George Whitfield, wasn't he? Read biographies like Whitfield and Carey. It's said that Whitfield preached an average of a thousand sermons a year. And he was an evangelist. He was not a resident pastor. An average of a thousand sermons a year for about 30 years. You know about the labors of Carey, the, the Baptist missionary from England who went to India and gave his life there. 
His, his works were abundant. He was involved in translating uh, the whole Bible into nine different languages. The whole New Testament into another 21 languages. Portions of the New Testament into an additional five languages. He worked while it was day. We may not be called to that level, level of labors in the gospel of Christ. But we are not called, brethren, to nothing, are we? We are called to bring the gospel to those in our Jerusalem and Samaria. And as God gives us opportunity to the farthest corners of the earth, what gospel endeavors, we need to always be asking, are there that we can do? May God give us the zeal, the faith, the grace, and the faithfulness out of love for the souls of men and love for our Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and ask now that you would write it upon our hearts, that you would stir us up to seek the lost, and to preach the gospel. Help us to work while it is day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.